Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Today's guest, an Englishman, Everett True, who was involved with several key British music magazines throughout the 1990s and 2000s, including NME, Melody Maker and Plan B. Everett moved to Brisbane in 2008 and immediately made a name for himself by deriding popular bands such as Silverchair, The Vines and Savage Garden as musical abominations, in a memorable article for The Guardian. At the time, these comments caused significant waves among the Australian music writing fraternity, and as an arrogant, opinionated young writer myself, it took some time for me to see past True's brash, abrasive style of writing to view him as a real person with real feelings. Over the years, he and I have become friends and colleagues, supporting each other's works as freelancers and forming an unlikely bond. Besides his work as a prominent music critic, True is an accomplished author, having written books on Nirvana, Ramones and The White Stripes, among others. More recently, while living in Brisbane, he has been a PhD student at Queensland University of Technology, and when I met him at his home in the western suburb of The Gap in early June, he was eagerly awaiting feedback on his PhD. You'll hear his children running around and playing nearby as we talk about how he failed English in high school, the Blondie song that first endeared him to pop music, the origins of his pen names, his tumultuous relationship with alcohol, and the time when he pushed Kurt Cobain in a wheelchair in front of tens of thousands of people at Reading Festival in 1992. Introducing Everett True, freelance music critic and author. Everett True. Hi, how are you doing? Very well. Good. How are you? I'm good, yes. I thought I'd ask to begin, what's going on in your life right now? You're about to make a, a rather big move. Again. Yes, that's right. Yeah, well, a couple of things. First up, um, we've got to emigrate back to the UK end of this month, end of June. Um, just sort out a couple of just, you know, stuff, um, financial things. Uh, so we've been here for seven years, so that's quite a big deal. And the other thing was, um, when I realised that we were going at the end of June and we've been here for seven years, and five years of that I've been pretending to do a PhD, I thought maybe I ought to start doing that PhD. And so a few weeks ago I decided I ought to write the thing. So a couple of days ago I handed it in, 95,000 words. What's the PhD on? It's on myself, the slow death of Everett True. Is that how you pitched it? Yes, it, the title is The Slow Death of Everett True, The Changing Role of Popular Music Critics in Web 2.0 Environments. How has the ending, or what you've written, what you submitted a few days ago, how does that line up with what you first proposed five years ago? Um, five years ago, it's hard to remember now, um, It was all very kind of, oh my God, you know, everything's gone, everything's dissolved, the music industry's ending, music journalism's ending. There was a really interesting point I saw in um, another student, some MA thesis, I think, on a very similar topic, which came out about a year ago, which was about music journalism. And it was saying, well, you know, then... Actually, it's not music journalism that's some kind of, you know, it's not the death of the music journalist or anything like that. What it is, is an end to a very specific form of music journalism, and that's rock criticism. They're talking about a particular model, um, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, the role of the music critic is over, you know, in taste-making formation. They don't actually mean that. They mean rock critic, and they're talking about the ideology of rock, and they're talking about how it applies to, you know, in the music press and kind of the idea that one band is better than another band, that one band is more authentic than another band. Um, and that's kind of neither here nor there. I mean, if anything, we should be celebrating the fact that rock criticism is still around, um, bearing in mind that rock ceased to be the dominant force in music like 20 years ago. Uh, music stopped being the dominant force in entertainments 
um, about 20, 30 years ago as well. So it's like pretty amazing that rock criticism's still around in many respects. Mm. And no, I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is, yes, I mean, um, times of great upheaval are times of the greatest opportunity. Have you found that personally? Uh, no, not entirely. But I mean, that's like, that's that's more to do with my individual approach. I think if I decided to kind of in, I kind of what happened when I came out to Brisbane was I started doing this PhD. I kind of brushed up against the music industry in Australia as a whole, kind of not necessarily in a very positive fashion. Um, I kind of felt like it was stepping back in time in many respects. Um, kind of moving out to Brisbane and Australia generally. And in regards to kind of arts criticism, it's a lot of the attitudes seem quite... It's, it feels like people have kind of discussed them, kind of, you know, over in the UK and America, that <coughs> there are so many more critics um, and there's so much more of a tradition of it. It means people have kind of examined it and discussed it and argued for it over you know however many decades now and the arguments that um kind of lowbrow critics were having with highbrow critics they took place like 30 or 40 or 50 years ago um but they're still taking place in australia even if highbrow you know and highbrow criticism isn't really there isn't that much of it here either hmm. um so it, it makes it difficult because it's like you know as you know yourself it's like music criticism still isn't valued very highly here um, in the UK it's kind of a given so you kind of come over here with all these assumptions about your role in society and you don't realise that there are assumptions until all of a sudden your role no longer exists because that's not how people view it So you're surprised at what you found here? Yeah, to a degree because you kind of take it for granted a little bit because you kind of think well Australia's got a fairly similar kind of culture to the UK and to the US um, everybody speaks the same language they kind of all watch the same US films and TV um, so yeah I mean I, I was taken aback a bit because the previous time I'd lived in Australia because we were here between 1999 and 2000 for a year um, I didn't really encounter that but that's because newspapers were a lot kind of stronger as a force when I was writing for The Age hmm. well let's take Back to that first visit, what what brought you to Australia in 99, 2000? Uh, we just wanted, I, I kind of come to the end of my, um, uh, I don't know, very um, privileged lifestyle kind of as this kind of rock and roll journalist going wherever he chose and drinking however much he wanted, which was taking place in the 90s. Um, music press was starting to change. Um, the old Melody Maker editor left or kind of got kicked upstairs to uncut um, in about 1996 and kind of everybody including himself was expecting me to take over. It didn't happen because the publishing company were like, well the enemy and the Melody Maker are exactly the same paper, we need someone who can separate them. Mm. Um, so I got pushed on to another magazine, Vox, which I was made the editor of. I was told to make it as mainstream as possible, so obviously they've been reading my stuff very closely. Mm. So I attempted to, but from my own particular perspective, um, it folded six months later because no one informed our readership. Um, and I got paid off, went over to Seattle for a while, worked at The Stranger, which is fabulous, then Transpire couldn't stay there any longer. So I didn't want to go back to the UK, so that's why we went to Australia, mm. as you know, Roughly, I didn't want to go back and go back in time, and I couldn't see the point in it. Did you have any writing work lined up? No, I never have anything lined up wherever I go. I wish I did. It's like when I came out to Brisbane, I didn't know a single person, didn't have any work lined up. Um, now I'm going back to the UK, I don't have any work lined up. Um, you know, I, I don't know why I operate like that. My wife certainly doesn't know why I operate like that. You've had some considerable considerable influence and success as a, a critic, a journalist, an editor, an author. Let's take a lot of steps back. What were you like as a child? Were you a heavy reader and a writer or what was interesting to you as a child? Um, as a child I was, um, yeah, I mean I read a lot of books. I mean I can remember when I was about 15 or 16 
um, going to the couple of libraries in town and you're allowed to take out, I don't know, something like 12 books on a ticket or six books on a ticket. And I would be reading about six books a day. Um, I mean, really, you know, I wasn't a fast reader, but I would just read that many. Um, mostly, I, I devoured pretty much the entire science fiction genre wholesale. Mm. Not Asimov for some reason, but everybody else. Mm. In particular, um, Harlan Ellison and um, Michael Moorcock. Um, uh, the science fiction genre wasn't as big back then. I mean, it really wasn't. Um, I also, um, from the age of about 14, 15, was a really big um, reader of comic books. Um, got into them via superhero comics, but very, very rapidly um, moved on to underground comics, which in the 70s were this, had this kind of ridiculous duality, which veered very heavily between just anything goes, which means you kind of just make kind of porn kind of cartoons of Disney characters um, and incredibly over-sexualised, um, quite frequently just sexist um, portrayals of women. Um, Robert Crumb would be a very obvious example of that, but Crumb's always a bit more interesting um, than most of the people who copied him. Um, and, and so it veered between that and, at the, and then it, uh, there kind of wasn't any middle ground. The rest of it was kind of like feminist, you know, really, really strongly feminist cartoons, um, particularly um, people like Trina Robbins, um, who I guess went on to inspire people like Roberta Bailey um, and some of the better known ones now. Um, so yes, I mean, I did, I did read a lot. I wasn't, I didn't particularly write. I failed English at school. Hmm. Um, when I went to college very briefly to study maths and philosophy, I really enjoyed the philosophy lectures, but I had to drop out after a term because I couldn't write essays. No one had ever told me how to do it. I did maths. What, what was missing? Like, I, I didn't know. know how to do it's it. It's quite I amazing. I didn't That's know the structure. The fact that you have made a living as a writer and yet you failed English in high school is like a fascinating... Uh, yeah, well, when I first started writing for anime, um, the reason they took me on was quite clearly, looking back at it, was because I was a personality. I didn't think of myself as a personality, but I was a compare at this um, club, the living room that Alan McGee ran, that all the journalists went to every week. Um, so, of course, they knew who the hell I was, and I did my own fancy, and I couldn't write. I couldn't form sentences. Um, I would make up words because I didn't know the words, and I used lots of exclamation marks because I didn't know how to use punctuation. Um, but they printed my stuff, and they pretty much had to print it as it was. They had to make a decision, either print it as it is or not, um, because it was pretty much impossible to edit. And I think they just liked the idea that there was this weird kind of voice. Um, it was more to do with the fact that I was immersed in music. You know, I only learned how to write when I started editing people. Hmm. I'm still not a particularly good writer. I mean, I have my moments, but um, pretty much everybody else is better than me in some, some respects. Not every respect, but in some respects. Just going back a bit, where did you grow up? Uh, in Chelmsford, in Essex. It's suburbia. Um, nowadays, it's more kind of just part of Greater London. Um, it's about um, 30 minutes away on the train. Um, but back then, it kind of was just losing its own identity. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad, uh, well, they were both teachers towards um, the end of their careers. Um, before that, my dad, uh, he kind of flitted in and out of jobs because he was something pretty high-powered at um, Marconi Electronics, but left it um, because of conscientious kind of... He was asked to develop a kind of bouncing bomb or something, and he really didn't want to. I think he was a conscientious objector in the 50s when they still had the draft. Mm. Um, and my mum, well, there were six children, so my mum kind of uh, looked after all of us until she got in her 40s, and then she was like, wanted some kind of life for herself. Um, so she went to teach training college and ended up as a deputy headmistress of a junior school. Um, my dad um, should have been teaching university students because he was an incredibly talented mathematician. In fact, he ended up, just before he retired, working on computer programming in the early days of computer programming at the age of 60 or something, you know, mm. um, for the council. Um, but he was an incredibly talented mathematician, but um, he was teaching because he was very much kind of about the community. He had quite, he was a liberal, but he had very strong kind of left-leaning 
kind of ideals. He very much believed in public service, you know, in, in kind of um, the, the National Health Service and, um, you know, um, schooling for everyone. So he ended up teaching at uh, some really hardcore high school where the children just tore into bits. And so in mm. the end, he just got out of there, which was such a shame. He should have been teaching university. I mean, the one thing that taught me was never kind of, you know, be careful. If you're ever going to be a teacher, be careful who you teach. Mm. You know, be aware of your own limitations there. You've become a teacher and a tutor in later life, which we'll get to later on. Yeah. Six children, where were you in the hierarchy? I was fourth. Right, right. Um, it's weird kind of being fourth. You kind of, um, it's not that you don't feel valued necessarily, you just feel invisible. Um, you know, uh, the first couple of kids always the kind of high achieving ones, or normally anyway. Um, my two elder brothers um, both did really well at school. I was the first one not to do well at school. Um, I don't know whether that was because I was lazy, whether because I just wasn't as intelligent. I'm not. I'm, I've no idea. You know, um, I don't know what my motivation was was back there. I wasn't aware of the outside world. <coughs> um, I didn't know what was, you know, I was very much, it was only when I was about 15 I actually became aware of the outside world. I just kind of, I don't know, I, I, I just, um, you just kind of feel invisible when you're, when you're um, fourth in line. Were you introverted? Um, I, I think I was, although most people, when Charlotte first met me, um, you know, however long ago that was, 95, 96, um, and when most people first meet me, they think I'm an extrovert. Um, I don't see that myself at all. Um, I've never felt that way. Um, uh, you know, identity is a weird thing. You know, it's a lot of identities down to how other people perceive you, not how you perceive yourself. Mm, mm. Um, so I can't really answer that question. Yes, I think I was. But then again, I mean, I can remember vaguely, because I can't remember most of my childhood, um, you know, deliberately um, going out my way to get into trouble in class um, so I wouldn't get bullied um, and kind of ending up as kind of the leading troublemaker in terms of punishments doled out. I wasn't malicious. I was just mischievous. Why were you bullied? Oh, well, it's just, you know, I, you, back then I think bullying, I don't know, sometimes it's more endemic than some places than others. In my junior school, uh, the one I went to was a very rough junior school. It was on the local estate. And, um, yeah, for every day between the ages of 7 and 11, pretty much. So by the time I got to my senior school, I kind of knew how to get out of that. And my senior school was kind of a fifth-rate public school, which in the UK back then meant it was mostly private with a few scholarships tacked on. Me and my three brothers wore scholarships and hand-me-down clothes and free school meals. And because of that, um, you know, we got, got looked down upon by all these rich idiots, because mm. that's what they were. Mm. Until I got to about my sixth form and punk suddenly got into fashion and all of a sudden all these rich kids were pretending they were poorer than me. <laughs> you know, I shared a room with three brothers till I was 18. Mm. Didn't have to, I just wanted to, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you close with your siblings nowadays? Not particularly. I, I, I don't, it's not that I don't get on with them. I get on with all of them fine, but we'd never... Our mum always kind of trained us. Um, she, she denied it later on, but she always kind of trained us to just kind of move, you know, get on with our lives as soon as we left home. Mm. Right. What were your ambitions as a, I, a although teenager? After, um, after um, I did leave home, went to college briefly, I was actually in a band with my brother for a couple of years, a mm. sort of band, yeah, with right. one of my brothers. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> what was my ambition? Yeah, as a, you went to college to study maths no, and no philosophy. No idea whatsoever. I did that because that's what you did. Yeah, right. Um, I didn't want to be there. Um, in my second year, um, I deliberately um, didn't fill any of my exam papers in and just wrote kind of essays saying why I wasn't filling them in. Um, and the <laughs> that's, reason pretty, I, that's pretty meta. The reason I did that was because I didn't want to disappoint my parents and if I dropped out, I knew that would disappoint them, so I had to fail my exams. Did you have an ideal job or career None or industry? None whatsoever. I had, I've never had any idea, even now, I've never had any idea what I wanted to do. I've been so envious of people throughout my life who know what they want to do with their lives. I've never known. Hmm. 
I mean, now I could tell you what my ideal job is. So it was, but, 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 but it wouldn't exist because I'm not that person. It's to be ever true in the 90s. But I mean, I couldn't do that because I have three kids. It's not possible. Mm, mm. Even if that, was op- even if that um, opportunity was offered to me, I couldn't do it. Um, my ideal job now, yes, I do know it, it would be to be a staff writer for some decent publication. You know, say The Guardian would be a pretty good example of that. Be a staff writer and chose what I wrote and how I wrote it. But again, that opportunity doesn't really arise. Very thin on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not really that good a writer to pull that off. This is the problem. And, and I've never, you know, you've been quite smart. You've, you know, from fairly early on, you've expanded your remit. You know, you've expanded your brief. I've never done that. I have had opportunities, but I haven't really ever done it the same way. You know, I've always kind of, I've always felt that I could have done. I still feel that I could have done. I still feel I'd be awesome if I was writing about politics, for example. I think I'd be great on that. Um, I don't know that much about politics at the moment, but I mean, that's research. Mm. You know, what, what's research? Research is nothing. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, I know that goes against academic kind of... But it is. I mean, research, anybody can bloody do research. Jesus. Mm. Especially in the day of Google and, you know... Um, no, I've never known, ever, ever. You know, when, when, I went, when I was at school, I had no idea at all. People were vaguely saying, oh, maybe you should be an accountant. They earn lots of money. Mm. Or an actuary because they earn even more. And it's like, well, okay, I don't know what you have to do to do that. Uh, maybe. So I went to college and I wanted to do philosophy. I knew that much, which was nothing to do with anything. It's just that was what I actually wanted to do. Was it philosophy or psychology? I think it was philosophy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I thought um, Freud was a wanker. Though. Jesus. Um, so you're good at math, mathematics. Oh uh, yeah, I mean I'm okay at it. I'm, I'm probably not that good anymore. Um, but I was all right. Yeah, I mm. mean it's something I, that came to me naturally. Mm. Um, when did music enter your life? Uh, later, uh, when I was seventeen, I had a bunch of friends I just made. I didn't make friends that easily. Uh, they were into comics. And they started listening to punk and it was kind of a choice between listening to this music that I didn't really care about uh, or making new friends. Um, So I chose the former. And then I heard a song that where it all clicked for me. You know, I had that moment where it all clicked for me and it was Denis by Blondie. Um, Heard it on my, um, on the tinny little wireless radio, uh, wireless, um, transistor radio we had um, in our dining room. And I was like, yes, I understand it now. What did you hear in that song? Uh, what, what, I heard what the promise of a future life. Hmm. I heard, I heard um, desire and, and attraction and uh, s- sexuality um, and, and just a great tune as well. Um, it, the, there, was, the, there was so much contained, there was so much promise contained within that, those couple of minutes. Um, that's what it was really Um, I mean if I'd known a little bit more about music I would have understood where it came from but it doesn't matter you know I mean it's 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 what matters is the immediate effect the music has on you you know I mean I still the song above that that I still would never ever tire of hearing I must have heard it thousands and thousands of times is um uh, is Be My Baby by the Renettes you know, which is the song which has inspired like millions of other songs, um, because there's there's something about it, it's complete, um, and, and it's um, I, I guess I kind of liked Denis for the same reason I liked Spider Man in the seventies. You know, it was it was the promise of something else that was outside of, you know, it, it seemed attainable, but at the same time unattainable. Hmm. Did you know that music criticism or music journalism were career avenues or any, you know, people, no, I had people, no idea people were paid to write about music? Did they? I had no idea. I worked in a news agent, so I was fully aware of, you know, all the different magazines being sold. I, um, I did a newspaper round from the ages of 11 till 18. Um, and then I worked in the news agents for quite a while. Mm. And um, I would pick up all of the um, the big four at the time, um, Melody Maker, Enemy, Sounds and Record Mirror. Um, and I would read them pretty much from cover to cover because they were our Bible. Um, there wasn't anything else designed for 
people like me or people my age. I, I can't speak for females here. I don't know how gender specific they were at that point in time. Um, I suspect they probably were pretty gender specific, bearing in mind rock is gender specific. Um, but they, they were absolutely, there weren't any other magazines. You know, there weren't any of the kind of FHM or Maxim or Lifestyle magazines or, or you know, Q or The Face. Rolling Stone was American. I'm not sure we even saw it at that point in time. Um, and and these were people kind of, and it wasn't just about music, it was about everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, very much back then, it was about politics, it was about society, you know, it was about, and, and they also covered all the media, it wasn't just music. You know, it was about the only place you could go, you know, literally. Um, so these, these some of the writers, they become like kind of, uh, I think, gods you know to you because they are kind of you're following their every word you know you tune into some you tune out from others um they are writing the gospel you know very Mm. much so um within your own world um i certainly had no intention of joining their ranks Mm. never you know you would read it you would you would argue over it you would get angry about some of them you would agree with others um but no, I mean, if somebody had mentioned to me the idea that I could be one of them, it's like, what? what a, nobody ever did, because, I mean, it wasn't even within our frame of reference. Hmm. Um, it was more likely that you might get a little bit famous being in a band, perhaps, um, but not that likely either. Um, Just take me back to the newspaper run. You did that for seven years. Yeah. What do you recall about that? What did you learn from that job? Uh, don't... Um, Go, don't go cycling too fast when it's icy. Um, mainly be careful on roundabouts when there's big lorries kind of going around. You know, they need more space than you might think. Um, I don't know. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, you don't necessarily enjoy getting up when it's colder in your bedroom than it is outside and it's about minus 10. But um, aside from that, you know, I mean, it's just something you did. You know, I mean, you don't really, it doesn't necessarily enjoy doesn't necessarily come into it you don't really think about things in those terms you mm. just do it mm. because otherwise you won't have any money mm. how long were you at the news agent for working news agent working there um i'm not sure probably about six or nine months um it was pretty bad though i mean i i stole you know i was um for for several years in my late teens because we didn't have any money um, I was, you know, I shoplifted, I stole, I, you know, I was, I was pretty lucky, to be honest, not to get caught. Um, I, and I, I did get caught a couple of times, but the fact I went to a public school probably counted in my favour. Hmm. Um, what did you shoplift? Oh, just stupid stuff most of the time. Um, I, I, ultimately, most of my goal was just to have enough money to buy records. You weren't able to, you didn't shoplift from the record stores, that was way off limits. <laughs> You know, because imagine if you'd been caught, you'd never been allowed back in there. Mm. I mean, I don't think you even thought about it in those terms, but, you know, just way off limits. No, it's just stupid stuff from supermarkets and WH Smiths and, you know, stationery and um, and from the news agents. Unfortunately, it was money, but because I was working the till. I'm wonder- wondering whether this comes back to what you are saying earlier about feeling invisible. Was it a way of acting out, of, of drawing attention to yourself, or were you just yeah. doing it purely on your own terms and not telling anyone else about no, it? No, I wasn't telling anybody else about it. Right, no. right. No. I was, I was, if I thought about it, I would have been really embarrassed about it. Hmm. Um, no, it wasn't to impress anyone, no. It was because I wanted the money. Fair enough. When did you start going to shows? Um, the first show I went to was in 78, when I was 17. Um, and it was the Buzzcocks at Chelmsford Odeon, which is a big cinema. Um, and I was so naive when I went to that show that I thought the support band were the Buzzcocks. Um, and I couldn't understand why I didn't really recognise any of their songs. Um, and I couldn't understand why everybody's... I got up to leave after they played and nobody else was staying. And I was like, what? Hmm. I was in the front row. I got a ticket right at the last second. I only went because my mate from just around the corner was going... Um, and the first that the band that sport buzzcocks was Subway Sect actually, um, who a band I in, you know, um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I you know, a big, one thing I think 
our family in particular, noticing my brothers, the way they kind of are, um, and my and my um, and particularly my sisters, um, is we don't really have much kind of um, notion of shame in terms of making a fool of ourselves in public. You know, we don't care if people particularly laugh at the way we dance or the way we, you know, act a bit stupidly. Uh, some people do, some people don't. Um, we don't particularly... I've never really thought about it, but, I mean, I think that's the, that's the case. You were in a band with one of your brothers. What did you perform? What did you do? Well, the first band that we were in was actually before I even bought records. Um... And that was a band called Fix Grin. The um, first name for that band was Blowjob. Um, I was pretty naive in those days. My mates told me it's because I blew down a recorder. So I wrote the name all over my school books and got put in detention. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really had no idea. Um, and that was kind of... I, I, it's interesting because I was just putting together a proposal to maybe do a Daniel Johnston book for 33 and a third. And... Um, one of the reasons I latched on to Daniel Johnson fairly early on was because I felt kind of there were parallels between the way he discovered music and I discovered music. It was it was quite similar. He learnt to play piano um, by teaching himself from the Beatles song but The Complete Beatles. I learnt to play piano the exact same way. Um, he's a better pianist than me, that's for damn sure. Um, and I would just sit there thumping away at these chords, you know, hour after hour after hour. Um, because that's how I that's how I first discovered popular music before I bought anything. In fact, f even now I will hear Beatles songs and I'll go, they're doing it all wrong. <laughs> this doesn't sound any... They, they just don't understand how to do their own songs. <laughs> They've got the emotion all wrong. They, they're, they're interpreting it wrong. Why are they treating this like a throwaway song? Join the dots between your burgeoning interest in music and starting to write about it. You mentioned Alan McGee earlier and that club hanging out with other rock journalists. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that band, um, the band, that was a made up band, Blowjob, Fixed Screen. We never ever played any gigs. We would record like these really experimental kind of uh, uh, songs. They're experimental because we didn't know any other way to do it. We couldn't do cover versions because we weren't that smart. So we would stick drumsticks under guitar strings, rifle packs of cards next to the speakers, you know, um, play recorders. Um, and we'd make cassette tapes, you know, like one or maybe two copies, which we'd never give to anybody else. And we, But we'd also make up like badges and flyers and stuff mm. and post them around town. Um, and get them sold in record shops. Um, and and um, later on, Fix Green did actually play a couple of shows at the, uh, the Alan McGee Club. Um, yeah, so Alan McGee, yeah. Um, the other band I was in with my brother was um, the legend of his Swinging Soul Sisters, and they were fantastic. I still think to this day, in many ways, the best thing I've ever been involved in. Um, simply because of the way we formed. Um, I was a screen printer for about six years in the 80s. I was awful. Oh, my God, I was a bad screen printer. <laughs> oh, I'm really not that like, that type of person. I started, you know, just helping out with a family friend for, like, one day, came back for a couple more days, ended up staying six or seven years. You know, I was doing it when I'm, I started at Melody Maker. Um, and me and my mate, Dave Smith, the very busy man, um, who was an art school graduate or dropout, I don't know, um, we would sing along to the radio, like you do at work, you know, Steve Wright in the afternoon. Um, and we would sing along and we'd be like, oh, we're great at singing along to the radio, like you are. And Dave would be like, oh, we should do this, you know, we should just do this, we should form a band and do this. So one day, this would have been after I'd met Alan McGee, but only shortly after, um, I saw an ad in the back of the enemy which was asking, it was just around the time nightclubs were really in vogue in the music press, drinking cocktails and listening to Carmel and Sade and people like that. And um, there was an ad in the back of the NME asking for new and exciting acts um, for the, for the um, club. And Dave was like, oh, you should phone them up. I was like, all right, I will. So I phoned them up. And I was, and some, and the owner answered the phone and I was like, he's like, all right, so, so what you got? And I was like, well, 
uh, we're completely vocal, we're a cappella, um, and we've got dance routines, we wear suits and ties, and our big thing is we do new songs, we do punk songs. And he's like, that sounds brilliant, can you send me a tape? I was like, uh, no, because we believe that live performance is the thing, that's it. Um, can't, we don't record tapes, it's just about live performance. He's like, that's brilliant, can you play next Tuesday? So we had to form our group with my brother, who's the third member, mm -hmm. get some suits from a charity store, and we went down there and did Love Will Tear Us Apart and a couple of other kind of, and the, apparently the owner had tears of laughter running down his face. I mean, we must have been absolutely atrocious. <laughs> but we kept doing that. In fact, that was one of my main things when um, McGee started up the um, living room was I kind of derived my persona a lot from that kind of legendary Swinging Soul Sisters, the kind of a cappella. You know, one of our songs, for example, uh, we had a Ramones uh, medley um, where we did something like 23 Ramones songs in two minutes. Um, we did one set, I remember this set in particular, where we came out, did one song, went left stage, so of course everybody was like, more, more. So we did three songs in the encore, then we did the 23 song Ramones medley. And then, but the one thing we realised about rehearsals was it was not important to rehearse the songs. That didn't matter. I mean, that was, you know, it was actually funnier if you didn't rehearse them. Um, what was important was to rehearse the ad libs. So in many respects, we were kind of Bono like 30 years early. <laughs> right. And how did that transition into writing? Um, well, simply, um, McGee, well, when I first met Alan, um, he was still working on railways in Scotland, um, or, or I think he was still living in Scotland when I first met him. He moved down to Tottenham in London shortly afterwards, a really rough area. Um, and... Um, uh, we we kind of we became best mates um, and he had these ideas on you know what he was going to do how he's going to um, take over the record industry right from you know he really did have these very focused ideas and he had a whole plan worked out which was kind of based on a couple of other people Tony Fletcher who did a, a fanzine called Jamming which was connected with Paul Weller somehow and um, Dan Tracy from Television Personalities, who had his own record label and his own club. Um, and so Alan, kind of looking at these, kind of was like, all right, we're going to do our own fanzine, we're going to start up our own club, and with the proceeds from the club, we're going to fund the record label, which is what he did. Mm. Um, so with the fanzine, he kind of, I think he'd already kind of got a fair amount of it written, I, I can't remember exactly, when he asked me if I'd um, write a column, I was like, I don't think so, I mean, I can't write. You know, I really can't. I tried to write a couple of record reviews for some kind of college free sheet a couple of years before. It's appalling. Um, and he's like, no, it doesn't matter. You're the most passionate person about music I know. He's, he's like, just write about everything you hate. I was like, all right, um, I guess. Um, so I just did this column called The Sound of Music um, after one of my favourite films. And I just ripped into kind of everybody and this weird thing happened after the first issue came out maybe a couple of weeks later um, one of the lines I put in was um, how Cherry Red are a bunch of hippies um, which was the big kind of trendy record label like, independent record label at the time and um, I got called up by the A&R person at Cherry Red and he uh, at work and he just swore me down the phone for like 45 minutes <laughs> um, and I was kind of in a state of shock but then afterwards I was thinking isn't that what I wanted to happen? Yeah. I upset, he upset me, so I upset him. <laughs> That's what, how it should be. Well, interestingly enough, I saw, several years later, I saw in a Paul Morley book, Ask, um, he was recounting a very similar story with Steve Harley, um, where he kind of panned him, and, or hadn't even panned him, and Steve Harley was having a go at him um, for being an NME journalist. Um, I, you know, the NME had terrific power back then. Um, so, so I, I don't think, I think I'd fallen out with McGee by this point when I, I, when I approached... I should say, for context, Alan McGee founded Creation Records, who yeah. released My Bloody Valentine, Primal Scream, Ride. Oasis, Ride. Yeah. Uh, he also managed the Libertines. Mm, okay. Um, That's just for yeah. our listeners who may not be aware. Um, you wrote under a pen name in that the first The Legend. Column. Yeah. Right. Um, that was, it got shortened... Um, at the first club Alan put on, he um, 
as a joke, he asked me to come out because I was totally shy and, you know, insular. And <laughs> he was like, I was the least likely person to ever come out a club. And uh, again, as a joke, they call me um, the legendary Jerry Thackray, which got shortened to the legend. And I very strongly suspect, no one can quite remember, but I very strongly suspect it would have been Andrew Innes, who was later one of the main guys in Primal Scream, who would have been responsible for that. Um, because it would have been Andrew's kind of sense of humour. Um, and so I became the legend just as a joke. And um, But because of the legend of these swinging soul systems where we practiced the ad-libs, and we based ourselves on some kind of weird mutant kind of model of the Blues Brothers, which is why my brother, and Ramones, obviously. And um, I don't know who the other... I don't know where all the insults came from. But anyway, we, 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 we realised really early on that, that we could get the most laughs just by swearing the whole time and just by insulting people. Sometimes we'd get um, people um, trying to fight us as well, but I mean, you know, that was kind of unexpected. Hmm. Um, but so, but what happened was that kind of started to spin, that came from my writing, kind of, it kind of went back and forth. So all of a sudden, um, I kind of took on this persona that was quite belligerent, certainly in print and on stage as well. I don't know what I was like as a person. I suspect the same shy old kind of social retard. Um, but um, but certainly in, in print and on stage, I realised that, um, yeah, if you just yelled at people and insulted them, um, they thought it was hilarious. Provocation. Yeah. Hmm. So. You carried that through your career pretty successfully, I dare say? Well, it got reinforced when I got to Melody Maker. Mm. Now, the person I blame for Everett True, and he denies this, is David Stubbs, who is one of my fellow staff writers at Melody Maker. David Stubbs is probably best known to anybody who doesn't know Melody Maker, but knows a little bit about stuff, as the inventor of Mr. Abusing, which can still be found on the Quietus um, uh, regular interviews. He did a review of them... Cold plays last album, which got kind of shared millions of times. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I remember when I got to Melody Maker and they didn't want me to write as the legend because they said it was too associated with the enemy, I, was, I still didn't want to write under my real name. Um, and so I was discussing with David kind of, you know, other names, and I come up with this name, Everett True, which is a comic book character. And David was like, well, you should just be really over the top and really belligerent and really abusive. In fact, he was just, he was kind of conceptualising Mr. Abusing. But I kind of took that kind of a year early. And again, kind of, I mean, it was a creation, but it wasn't a creation, you know. I mean, it's a performance um, writing. It's It's a performance music criticism. And... I wouldn't have viewed it like that back then, but clearly that's how I approached it. You know, I was performing every time I sat down and wrote. Um, I think, if anything, for for a while, I was probably basing myself on the Beastie Boys or something, (laughs) who were clearly geeks as well. So you'd found work at Melody Maker, and you were now a full-time writer. Mm. Is that right? How did that happen? You, someone who fell English and had no pretensions of being a writer was well now. I still couldn't write when I got to Melody Maker that was the weird thing um, and it was quite embarrassing because they could write a lot better at Melody Maker or some of them could for sure um, and what happened was I've been there a couple of months I was still a screen printer and they didn't have many people in senior editorial positions really they had about they had three of them including Steve Sutherland who became the editor of the enemy later on but he was the assistant editor at that point in time and I remember watching them kind of going about doing stuff I was like you know you guys are fucking you're so weak you would not survive for like two weeks out in the real world and Steve was just like you know you know what fuck you if you think you can do it all right go on and that's how I got the job as reviews editor (laughs) and back then reviews editor this was in the time this was just on the cusp of computers being introduced Um, You had to proofread everything by hand about three or four times. You had to take all the phone calls. There weren't answer phones. You had to take all the phone calls from all the press agents. There wasn't email. Um, You know, and I had both the albums and the live reviews. They were major, major things. And what I quickly realised, one thing that I realised that nobody else seemed to grasp was the really important point of contact was with the readers themselves. That was the really important thing in terms of establishing your audience establishing your voice establishing your authority and 
how do you how 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 are you continual contact with the readers? The letters page. Mm. So I started. No one wanted to do the letters page because it was considered a bit of a pain in the ass. It didn't pay very well um, for freelancers, and you had to you know it, it was considered kind of drudge work. And so me and a couple of other journalists were just David Stubbs in particular. Um, we would just sit there and make the letters up. And we would make, who are you going to make the letters up about? Well, you're going to make them up about yourself. Of course you are. And that's going to increase your cultural, your, your, your cultural capital. It's going to increase your standing with the readers because all of a sudden they think everybody's talking about you. So they're going to start talking about you. So very rapidly, I got to be the best known name at that paper simply through the letters page, quite honestly. I mean, obviously the fact grunge kind of got associated with me had a lot to do with it. But I was the best known name before that. You know, I mean, it, the two kind of went hand in hand. And it was through kind of manipulating the letters page. I would only print the letters about me. Other journalists started complaining, but it's like too late. You know, I'd, I'd got it sussed and I was staff as well. So I could say, well, I'm going to do it, not you. <laughs> That's genius. self mythologizing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. When did you start making decent money from writing? When? Well, it was when I got staff at Melody Maker up till then, no. I mean, you know, I was doing a writer in the 80s because I was a freelance screen printer and I was a freelance writer. Um, and that's where I'm going to stop. And um, I was doing fine for myself, but it was only when I became got off that reviews editor job at the Melody Maker in 89 that I was able to stop being a screen printer at last. Mm. Um, and that's you know I, I, it wasn't particularly well paid but it felt well paid Jesus mm. you know for doing something you love mm. and you know it's and it's not just a living wage it's a little bit above and then when I became kind of a little bit kind of more kind of powerful and I managed to move myself into the staff writer position and then I got told to be the assistant editor even though I didn't want to be um, because I was worried it would curtail my drinking and my travelling um, I got pretty much unlimited expenses um, so although it was never particularly well paid the expenses bit certainly didn't hurt Was it a weekly paper? Yeah What was that like? The a lot of fun Managing the, di- the deadlines Just and... a lot of fun you know when you got the deadlines I've always been someone who Maybe it's because of that. Maybe it's because I was a screen printer, which also has very fierce deadlines. Um, but I always abide by the deadlines. If I'm not given any, then I won't do it, hmm. which is a pain in the ass when it comes to writing, say, PhD theses or books. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah, hell of a lot of fun, you know, because you get the sense of something going on all the time because there is something going on all the time. And it's really fun to feel, like, valued and wanted and... And you feel validated, um, and there's always something else happening. And this was in again, you know, this was in the days before kind of MP3s and community. You know, I mean, in the early nineties, we did communicate um, by email a little bit, but only a little bit. Um, most of it was by fax. You know, if you're abroad, you know, or you'd be kind of um, if you're away and they needed your copy urgently, you'd be dictating it down the phone. Um, it was it was just great because there was some you know and it's a lot of fun and you'd be out partying the whole time anyway, um, and very early on again I realised that I did not need to come in at a specific time because my editor didn't give a damn as long as I got my work done. Hmm. That was the important thing, and as long as it was done on time, and it always was. It was rare that we missed deadline. You know, I mean, in terms of getting the copy in, occasionally freelancers would. I was reminded of this the other day because I saw that um, Bob Stanley had done a review of the Stone Roses for The Guardian and he name-checked me in it a few times because I was his commissioning editor for, um, at the point, that point in time. Mm. And um, I fell out with Bob and I haven't actually spoken to him since this <laughs> because in about, I can't remember when it was, 93, 94, um, one of our writers was supposed to turn around a review of the St. Etienne album for a lead art review. Mm. He didn't do it and it was Monday morning and we had a big space in the physical layout of that arms page and the arm reviews editor was freaking out and he's like what the fuck are we going to do and I was like I'll review it he's like but you don't have the album I was like no (laughs) all right well I'll review it anyway and I don't know why but I decided to give it a bad review which was pretty mean considering you know I kind of liked him as well so I don't know what I was thinking of (laughs) Tell me about the drinking. Um, when did that 
become well a, again a I think David your... stops I think David stops for pretty much everything at this point in time <laughs> um, I can remember early on going well John Robb of the membranes and he founded a website a few years ago called Louder Than War which is still going in the UK which does okay for itself I think he actually asked me to go in with him on that um, and it was just at the time when Justin was suggesting collapse board and I was like mm, it's not look I'm going to try to focus on my local community kind of thing mm. um, anyway um, well it partly was tied in with the creation thing it partly tied in with a tour I did of Germany um, with the membranes and a couple of other bands 17 dates in 16 days or whatever you know one of those ones and Germany's a big country um, and uh, I certainly um, I took it to excess on that trip um, but more it was to do with the fact I still felt very isolated I still felt very much on the outside of things at the enemy um, and so when I got to Melody Maker, I can remember going down to the pub with all the writers and the editors early on and standing there kind of looking at the people drinking and, you know, getting on with each other, having a great chat. And, um, I, and I went over to David and I was like, David, you know, you seem like an intelligent kind of sensitive kind of fella. How little did I know him? Um, and I was like, so how the hell do you, you know, he's like, just drink. Hmm. So that's all you have to do, just drink. And then people will accept you. And, you know, I said, like, oh, it's that simple, is it? And then after I, I started doing that and I found I had a capacity for it, um, I quickly got to understand something else, which was that in rock and roll, where one of the main ways you establish capital, social capital amongst your peers is by getting more fucked up than the rest of them. That's what rock and roll is about to a degree then all you have to do is get more fucked up than the rest of them. Oh, I can do that. If I drink more than everybody else, then I'll get more fucked up and they'll respect me. Mm. I mean, I, I, I realise, you know, obviously that's very childish and everything, but it works. Mm. And I'm sure it still works. Um, so that's what I did. You know, I made sure that I was the entertainer. I guess it's kind of an extension of what I did at school when I was getting in trouble in class all the time, making sure, you know, that I would get noticed. I, d I didn't see it like that back then, but um, I'd be down, with, all the cool kids would be down with me because I was the one getting in trouble. Right. And, and you know, I, I grew up, and I, I don't really know where I got this from, um, uh, to a degree it would have been Alan McGee cause, and also Sub Pop Records when they started because the two rec labels there were distinct parallels in the way they started because they started off by bullshitting everyone so much that in the end everybody believed their bullshit um, and so they you know they went on about how many records they sold when they hadn't sold any mm. and how much money you know and all of that and saying how wonderful and making up pro quotes in the press and so I'd be watching someone like Alan McGee or, or Bruce Pavard and John Poman at Sub Pop and I'd be like well what's to stop me from doing that what's to stop me from making stuff up and inventing my own version of history and, and also you know if I'm away with a band and nothing's happening what's to stop me from inserting myself in a story again that kind of comes down to the fact that I couldn't write because I couldn't write I had to insert myself in there because how else was I going to make people notice me I couldn't, I didn't have any other way of making people notice me um, because I couldn't do it through the strength of my writing. I couldn't do it through my, my fluency or anything like that. The only way I could do it was by being myself. If people don't want to buy into that, that's fine. I didn't even think about it. But crucial to the way I've always been the legend and ever true and whatever is the fact I've never at any point in my time thought that more than a handful of people like me as I'm sure you can attest even today I still don't think people like me I still don't think people value what I do I still don't think I've got any influence or any power at all and and that's kind of it's very irritating on a lot of occasions but it's really crucial to the way I approach writing about music in as much as it frees you up. It, it, you know, if you really think that nobody likes you, then what the hell is stopping you from doing whatever the hell you like? Because it doesn't make any difference. No one likes you anyway. Hmm. You know, so, so, you know, I mean, I, I can certainly understand why people end up killing loads of people. Because nobody likes, you know, I, I can understand that. Well, I'm not saying I'm about to do that. I'm not saying I'm condoning them. But I can, I can understand the mindset. I can understand why people kill themselves for the same reason. 
um, it, it just frees you up. You have that kind of... Um, so the one thing that angered me more than anything else when I got over to Australia about the street press was you've got this vast untapped potential, this vast untapped established resource. You can do what the hell you like with it because no one really reads it. No one takes any notice, even if they do read of it. You can do what the hell you like with it then. You're not even getting paid or you're getting paid bugger all. You can do what you like mm. and people don't. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's people because they're so established in their set patterns. Um, but, but I was coming to Australia from America, from Britain. In America, I was writing for the equivalent of the street press. But the equivalent of the street press in America, some of those are amazing magazines. The Village Voice is like that. It's like, why is the Village Voice the Village Voice? And why is the music.com the music.com? Hmm. Well, it's down to, it comes down from, from above. It's not the people writing for it. Not really. The people writing for it are the enthusiasts. There's a great quote that I discovered um, talking about the changing role of music critic um, while I was doing my research from a fellow called Don McLeese who used to write for the um, Chicago Sun-Times. And he was talking about kind of the fact that times a great change, a great opportunity. And he put in this one great line, which was that none of us went into this for the money. Nobody does. Not writing about music. No one thinks they can make a living from it. Mm. You know, if you think you're going to make a living writing about stuff, then you expand immediately or expand after a certain period of time because otherwise you're not going to do it. Mm. I got a bit sidetracked there. You did. You did. You did. But that's okay. Just on the, the booze again, did you find writing while intoxicated you wrote better or you were more free in what you said and how you articulated it? It depends how intoxicated I was. On the whole... Um, I wrote when I was hungover um, and I really miss oddly enough I always miss being hungover more than I do being intoxicated wow. um, because I haven't drunk for several years now um, and it's that kind of that kind of sense of complete paranoia and unease and you know um, that I fed found really fed into the creative process mm. um, you're writing to escape that to a degree um, no, it depends how... I mean, I got pretty intoxicated, uh, you know, past the stage of being able to write. You know, I can remember certain instances where I'd be sitting later on in front of, like, a laptop or something, trying to hit the keys and unable to. You know, I'd just be thumping the keyboard and I'd be unable to type individual keys because I was so drunk. Um, I No, on the whole, I wrote when I was, intox when I was hungover which was m most of the time if I wasn't drunk. I mean, it was one or two stages. Mm. Otherwise, I hung over or I was drunk. How long did that uh, period of your life last, Al alternating between those two axes? Um, probably between about 89, I mean, properly, and about 96 when I met Charlotte. I mean, it still continued for a while after that. Um, but then probably till about 2001. Um, and I don't really remember much of it. I mean, I don't remember much of my life full stop, quite honestly. But that's okay when you can self mythologize and make it up, right? Yeah, <laughs> although it'd be kind of nice just to be able to, you know, it's, it's like when you're writing an article, it's kind of nice sometimes not to have to think of the whole bloody thing yourself. Mm. When did books enter the picture for you? Uh, running, I always used books. to swear I'd never write a book. I was always like, people only ever write books when they're dead because they've got nothing going on. Um, I should have written a book at the time. It's a shame I didn't, but, so, it, but I wasn't that person. Did you get an offer from Publisher? <laughs> I um. What was the first one? I got offered. Um, I got offered the chance to do the Nirvana biog that Michael Oz Azarad did, and I turned it down. Um, although people deny this now, um, but anyway. Um, and Kurt was like, well, you know what, you and me should write a book together. I was like, all right, yeah, that sounds a great idea. And he was like, yeah, we can do it like a fanzine. And I was like, yeah, that sounds a great idea. And I said, well, I'll just wait till you get a little less famous, all right? All right, because it's probably going to... And he's like, yeah, all right. And, but I was like, all right, but look, I tell you what. And so I went, I, I put this proposal together and I went down to see the some um, big name book publishers. I had no idea what I was doing. Um... And I, I sat in this meeting with them and I was, I, I was making all these ridiculous de demands of them. I was like, it's got to be a proper art book and it's got to be on really fancy paper and it's got to have this and have that. 
And they didn't care because Kurt Cobain was going to co-write it with me. They didn't bother them at all. And they said, well, how much do you think you want as an advance? I said, well, it's got to be at least £100,000. And that's kind of where the conversation ended. (laughs) Weirdly enough, now I tell that to you, I had a very similar conversation with Arts and Tourism and Trade Queensland just after I got to Brisbane, where they wanted to do a magazine in conjunction with me and they invited me to speak to them. And I sat down at a table with some very high-powered people from the state government. Uh, There are about 13 or 14 of them there. And I put together this whole magazine. Uh, I'd actually dumbed it up for them and I had kind of, you know, and they're like, yeah, this is all all going great. And I said, well, how much money do you think you'll need to start it up? And I said, well, realistically, to get the first couple of issues out, probably about half a million. (laughs) And that's, for some reason, where our conversation stopped again. (laughs) Right. Uh, Yeah, I never thought of the parallel there. Huh. Um... So, yeah, so the idea was mooted then, but, um, you know, um, I, 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 there's no way I was going to write a book then. Then basically what happened was there's a former Melody Maker journalist. I did a couple of photo, uh, photo-led books in the 90s. I did one on the Lemonheads, one on Supergrass, um, that literally took a weekend to write, 20,000 words. Right. The Lemonheads one I definitely wrote in the weekend. Uh, and Not your best work? It's all right. It's got a, I don't know, to be honest. I think the Supergrass one's probably bollocks. The lemon, <laughs> the, uh, at least the Lemonheads one's actually got interviews with the um, musicians in, you know, because I phoned them all up. Right. Um, we got paid a ridiculous amount of money for those things. I think the first time I did it, I got 3,000 quid, and this was back in, like, 96 or something. And the second one was 4,500 quid, which was, what, like, eight or $9,000? Yeah. You know, for doing some 20,000 words. It's not bad. Mm. I should have kept up with those. Mm. Um, but anyway. Um, and then, you know, but they weren't serious. Um, and then um, after we went to Australia and came back to England in 2000s looking for stuff to do, and this old Melody Maker journalist, had, a, he, he was commissioning editor at um, Virgin, I think it was, and he'd, he'd been saying to me for quite a while, he's saying, look, I know you don't want to do a book on Nirvana, but if you ever want to do a book, just let me know. And so in the end, I was like, look, I'm not going to do a book on Nirvana. I'll just do a book kind of collecting together some of my writing. Um, so that's what we did, Live Through This, um, which has been out of print for a very long time now. So that's kind of how it started. But that was really collecting together my writing. I haven't read it and I'd love to. It's, um, oh no, it's packed away there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I mean, I think I'd probably be embarrassed by it now if I saw it. Just on Nirvana and musicians more generally as a critic and as a journalist how did you navigate whether or not to be friends with these people well you don't you don't view it like this um you are friends with them because that's what you do i never had i know i know it's an ethical consideration for some people but ethics has never particularly bothered me uh there's a thing about scruples and morals i think what it was was i had quite a few morals but no scruples Something like that. Mm-hmm. It's actually a phrase I nip from Courtney Love, but anyway. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, when you see, the lines were always blurred for me. There never was a wall there for me because I came into um, writing for the enemy as a freelancer, as the legend. Uh, the reason I was there was because I was a performer and I just saw what I did in the enemy's performance as well and I continued releasing records and performing pretty much most of the time I was at the enemy. Um and so it's perfectly natural for me just to, it would have seemed, I immersed myself in the music and if you're going to immerse yourself in the music, if you're going to take that approach, you don't have to, but if you're going to take that approach, then to me it feels weird if you don't know the musicians. You know, what, why would you have an immersive approach where you're putting some things behind a wall, deliberately cutting them out? Um, if I didn't like something, I would say I didn't like it. If it happened to be something by some friends of mine, well, that was too bad. And I did do that. I went out of my way to prove that I wasn't biased and fell out some really good friends that way, Um, which I kind of regret now because I think a lot of the time I was doing it to prove a point and I could have just said it to their face first or something. Mm. You know, I've I've never really been very impressed with um, journalists or critics who interview people, go off to interview someone and they have a perfectly amenable conversation with them, uh, like we are now, and then go back home and then write a slagging of them. You know, if you're going to do that, do it to their face. Hmm. 
Um, which, you know, if, if I ever did that in interviews, I would have an argument at the time. Um, but no, I mean, I never saw that there was any kind of divide. I, I felt the divide was unnatural, I guess. I didn't, see that, I didn't see there was any difference between what I did and what the musicians did, except I was normally more entertaining <laughs> and more creative. You were close, correct me if I'm wrong, you were close with Kurt and Nirvana when they were one of the biggest bands in the world. Is that correct? Well, I don't know. You see, people tell me that. Um, I was always close to Courtney than Kurt. Um, and one of the reasons I was close to Kurt, if I was, was because I was Courtney's friend and there were very few Courtney's friends that he could stomach. Um... I don't know if the I was I'm still a little bit surprised at how big Nirvana were. You see, you've got to understand. I I operated in the music press in the British music press, and to me, you know, as as an 18 year old, 19 year old reading these music critics whose word was gospel, um, if a band was on the front of Enemy or Melody Maker, they were massive. So Nirvana were massive, but so were the Census things. You know, so so were Pink Milky Stand Alone. Um, I had no conception of how big or how small a band was outside of that. I knew they were big in our world, but that's different. But I mean, obviously, I was going to these big rock shows, yes. But, I mean, I still wasn't aware of how big they were. Well, there was that moment where you pushed a wheelchair out onto a rather large stage at a rather large festival. Yeah, but you're still not aware of it. You don't think about it you don't, because because there's never a moment when you step back. I mean, now I'm aware of it because I've been living for in Brisbane for seven years doing nothing. Now I'm aware of it. But back then, when you're living from day to day, from hour to hour, from minute to minute, you're not aware of change. Change is going on all the time around you and you're in the middle of it, but you're not aware of it. Mm-hmm. So, so these things, they, you know, people come in and out of your life. Um, you know, some people you hang out with more, some people you hang out with less. Some bands get to play bigger venues, some don't. But you're not aware of it. You're really not aware of it. You know, I, I know that sounds kind of weird now, but I, mean, I wasn't aware of it. It was, just so, it was just part of the everyday process. But was that fodder for your writing? Like, did you write about pushing Kurt out on the stage at Reading Festival in any of your, your work? Uh, years later. Mm. Uh, years later, yeah. But not really, because I can't remember it, and the stuff I do write is made up anyway, because I can't remember it. <laughs> right. I mean, I kind of glean it together from what other people who were there tell me. Well, there were a lot of cameras there in that instance. Yeah, um, but, but that one, I mean, I, you know, I, I've got little recollection of it, except knowing that when I was watching them from the side of the stage a bit later on, I was busting for a piss, so I went out into the crowd because I thought it'd be cool to go out into the crowd, and then I couldn't get back to stage again. Which I thought was kind of funny because hadn't I just been on that stage? <laughs> You've written several other books. Yeah. Ramones. The Ramones, White Stripes, White Stripes uh, and the Nirvana one. That's it. Did you enjoy uh, these? The writing yeah, I process? do writing books. I, I do enjoy writing books. It's a shame I didn't do the two I gave. I gave back Sonic Youth and Daniel Johnston. Um, which is a shame. Well, Sonic Youth, I wouldn't. I was only given eighty thousand words, and that's ridiculous. Sonic Youth, you need about a million words, and then you ain't got enough. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, I do enjoy writing them. I never look at them after I've written them, ever. Do you look at your book? No, you just don't. I do know you? it all in my yeah. head. So I mean, maybe at some point you think in the future I might go, you know, go back and look at it. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm, I'm embarrassed by them after I write them. Huh. I'm embarrassed pretty much. You know, at the time, I think whatever I've written is great. And sometimes I'll be punching the air because of what I've written, you know. Yeah. And so I'll just be so happy. But then afterwards, I'm just like, Jesus, why can't I just write one good thing? Huh. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like the way the White Stripes book is structured. I think it's really well structured and designed. I think it deserved a little bit more of a run, a tilt at the kind of windmill um, than it got. I think it still could still stand to being reproduced. Uh, the Ramones one, it's all right. I mean, I can't, again, I kind of like the way it's structured. If, but it's, 
you, you're, you're not like me in this respect because you're, you're quite considered you kind of map things out don't you you kind of plan things I don't do that um, you know so you just start and go from there yeah um, and that has its pluses and minuses and its minuses is that means I can be quite lazy at points unless somebody's really prodding me with a big stick um, so when I'm writing a book some of the time it's going to be filler which is really irritating to admit. I'm not sure that's quite as true with the Nirvana book, um, but it's certainly true with the Ramones book. That could be a good book if it had been kind of, if my editor had been a bit harsh on me, I think. The, I mean, the Nirvana book should have been cut back by a quarter, really. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it's, kind of a, it's kind of annoying in myself to know that. Um, that's just the way it goes. I mean, you know, a lot of people who've got similar approaches, I think, are probably fairly similar. It's like seeing a band, you know. What what are you looking for from a band? Um, you know, I like bands where I get, a, a lot of the time, I like bands where I get a feeling of spontaneity, but that means you have to accept the fact that some of the time they're going to be crap. Mm. You know, it's just the, it's the approach. I also really like pop music concerts because, you know, it's a completely different kind of mindset a lot of the time. I saw Charlie XCX down the valley a few weeks ago. She's marvellous. Um, just bam, 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 you know. Hmm. Totally worked out. What went wrong with those two books? Did you have those two advances concurrently? or were they No, no, they're times? separate times. The Sonic Youth one... Um, what year was this? Did you get This was then? just when we were going over here. I took it so I'd have some kind of income when we first got here. Can you say what the advance was? 2008. The, the money, I mean? The, the, the I had to give back the advance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say what it was or not? Oh, I can't remember. It's probably about... It, would have been, uh, it might have been about £5,000. I don't think it was much more. And I would have been paid half up front. It's a fairly standard deal. I don't think it would have been... It might have been a little bit higher than normal because it was straight after the Nirvana book, which had, which hasn't done as well as I expected, but it's done okay. It still hasn't come back out in paperback form in the UK, hmm. um, but it does still sell. And um, that one I gave back a couple of reasons. One, I shouldn't have taken it on in the first place because I knew how many words they wanted and I knew I, wouldn't, I just didn't want to do it. But it's also compounded by the fact that there was another Sonic book youth book being written at the time and Thurston in particular was like well I want to speak to the other guy first then I'll speak to you and I was like mm, I can't be asked, quite honestly um, so I gave it to a friend of mine Stevie Chick who's a great writer um, and he did it um, which was great because it meant he started writing books, it was his way in so I'm mm. pleased about that. The Daniel Johnston one was a little bit more conflicted than that um, it was did you pitch or did you get approached for that one? No, I, I think I got asked to do that again by the same company um, because, you know, I know the editor pretty well and I still do occasional bits and pieces for him. I did a, for example, intro to a Ramones graphic novel um, a year or two ago for him. Um, uh, the Daniel, jo I think he suggested it to me and it was a shame I didn't do it. I've actually... Um, interviewed about 20, 25 people for it before I didn't do it, um, including Daniel himself for about eight hours. Um, and he's, you know, um, and partly it was, I, I think I was just in the wrong space at that point in time. I know that sounds lame, but I mean, it was, Daniel was born. You know, we had Daniel Your the boy Daniel. instead of Daniel the book. Yes, yes. That's pretty much it. Right. Really. And on top of that, I had been fairly seriously ill, I think, shortly before, which probably had a knock-on effect, even, although I hadn't realised it. Hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, and I just, you know, I was completely out of practice in terms of being professional about writing about music. I was doing collapsible pretty much the whole time, which um, I don't think even its um, worst enemies would call professional. You know? Yeah, tell me about Collapse Board. How did that start? Well, it's simply because Justin asked me. Mm. Uh, Justin Edwards. Justin Edwards, photographer. Um, and I think he just saw, you know, he, he kind of likes going to shows and he doesn't really want to pay because, you know, he can take nice photos and that's fair enough. Mm. Um, and also, it wasn't just that though. I mean, he, like yourself, I think, was initially drawn to that big kind of kerfuffle that happened after I wrote that Guardian column about the um, street press and he, like yourself, was one of the very few people who actually came out and supported me early on. 
um, and he just couldn't understand why people were having go at me. But I think he was probably, to a degree, he could probably relate to the situation because he'd come out from England a couple of years earlier. Mm. Um, so he would have been familiar with my stuff from there. And, and your point with that article was that Australian critics don't criticise enough. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Mm. Which seemed to be a fair point, but, you know, whatever. Um, unless it's a fellow critic, then they can criticise. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he just suggested, and his idea has always been that it should be kind of focused on Brisbane, you know, Queensland, Australia. Um, uh, and, you know, it's kind of a better version of the street press to a degree, I think. That's kind of pretty much been his idea, um, I think, anyway. And um, so he asked me if I'd come in with it. As I said, John Robb actually asked me about the same time if I could do this uh, UK-based website with him. Um, but I felt, I love John, but I felt his approach to writing and my approach to writing are way too different for that to have worked. And also we'd be both pretty strong personalities in terms of what we want, and that's not really going to work to a degree. I mean, it can. But I think you need to be in different spheres for that to work. Mm. I do normally need a springboard. This is one of the troubles I've been having in Brisbane. I normally need somebody opposite me to push you, push you the stick, and also to bounce my ideas across. And yeah. but um, so so yeah, collapse board. And so the name comes from laughing Cl uh, laughing clowns. Who I believe at one point that may still be the case, or your favourite band in the world. Yes, absolutely. Yes, still the case. Indeed. Well, not favourite band in the world, favourite um, live band in the world. Yes, yes. Greatest live band I've ever seen, that's the quote. Yeah, I still believe that's pretty much true. Yep. Um, although Beyonce won some close. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, I was starting up my PhD at the time, and I was also, I, I get very frustrated and fed up with the approach, I, I, this isn't new, this has always been the case with the way people approach criticism, they seem to think of it as a kind of second rate, kind of, you know, second class citizen, kind of, you know, if you're a critic, you're less than other people or something, and that really bugs me, because that's to a degree is how I define myself, and I've always taken a real pride in what I do, um, so I guess I just kind of use it you know, I don't get paid for it, I've never been paid for it, so I, it's like I can do what the hell I like with it then, surely. I can do, you know, what the fuck? You know, it doesn't make any difference whether one person reads it or 10,000. I would prefer it if 10,000 people did. Clearly I would prefer it. I've always wanted as many people to read my stuff as possible. But I'm not prepared to go along with the other half of that sentence. I guess that's the big difference between me and a lot of other people. I've always, always, always wanted other people, loads of other people to read me. You know, this was one of my big points of difference with the early Riot Girls, was that they saw it as a kind of exclusionary thing, and I saw it as an inclusionary thing. I don't know how it's viewed now. I think to a degree it's, it's viewed as inclusive, which is great. But certainly early on, that's not how they viewed it. I did. We had ferocious arguments about it. You know, we're all in the same... Um, we we're all on the same side but how it should be kind of so so even now I believe that but at the same time I'm not prepared it depends what I'm doing <laughs> I mean you know I mean you could obviously I can argue with myself that what I do for the Guardian is a compromise yes it is a compromise but I'm writing for somewhere I like and respect and so I don't mind if they ch tailor my words to fit into their template. I understand that's what that's going on. I would have a much bigger problem with that if it was happening for a place I did not like. Much bigger, to such a degree I probably wouldn't work for them. Mm. At least they don't insert inaccuracies, or they haven't yet, which has happened in the past. Coming towards the end, you're leaving Australia soon. How yeah. will you look back on your time here as a professional writer? As a professional writer... Well, depending on whether or not my PhD is accepted as being PhD worthy, which I don't know yet, well, I'm still waiting to hear from my supervisors this, these couple of days, um, I think if I hadn't got that in, I would have viewed my entire time here as a complete um, failure. Um, I was quite disappointed. When I went out to Seattle for the nine months I was at The Stranger, I made a massive impact. Um, and I was very disappointed I didn't hear... Um, I always want to impact upon as many people as possible. That's why I write. Um, 
I, I don't ever think people like me. I don't ever think people read what I do. And that's compounded by something like Collapse Board, where you see the web traffic. It's, I've, I've been informed by loads of people it's artificially low when you see it on kind of, because it doesn't take into account various platforms and stuff. Um, but I have no idea. Um, I don't feel I'm reaching anybody at all, but then every now and then you kind of get emails from bands saying this is fantastic, you know, new bands saying you've just managed to book us a tour of the US, which has happened a few times, just through Collapse World. It's like, how can that be? And I don't know. I, I think... I think the biggest thing about being here is that I had to accept that my role had changed, that my my function has changed, that who I am as a person has changed, and a lot of that is to do with the fact I've got three kids. I would say pretty much all of that's got to do with that. I cannot immerse myself in music the same way. It's not possible. So I have to approach writing about it from a different way. I don't want to be fake in the way I write about music, um, whatever fake means, which I don't know. Mm. Um, that ties in with being inauthentic and I would argue against authenticity these days as uh, as to whether it even exists. Um, but clearly it exists because a lot of people find it relevant. Mm. Um, but seven years in Brisbane, I, I would have preferred it if I had been more engaged in the um, community, definitely. I would have preferred it if I had had more of a dialogue with other people. It's not their fault. I don't think it's their fault. Some of it's their fault. But most of it's down to me and, and down to my circumstance, down to the fact I live in a house in a gap where it's beautiful and I can't see the point in going out, you know, because it's, like, beautiful. You can just wander around and it's like, wow, you know. Mm. Um, I'll never get a house as nice as this one again, that's for sure. Mm. Um, not at this price. <coughs> um, Do you think you got off on the wrong foot you started on the wrong yes, foot yes I think I probably did um, but I wouldn't change that no fucking way I, I, I can't I can't you know what, what's the point um, yes I did get off on the wrong foot with that column but no I don't regret it because the fact of the matter is you know I, I don't want all the people who are mediocre and grey kind of being my mates and kind of dragging me down what's the point in it I don't want those people on my side and if they're the people who are going to set themselves against me, well, great. Hmm. That's what I want. Um, if that means I don't get any paid work, well, so be it. You know, I'm, I'm still able to survive. As I wrote on Facebook recently, um, Nina Simone will get you through times of money better than no money will get you through times of the money. Will, Nina Simone will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of no Nina Simone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it comes down to. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I regret not being part of the community more, not engaging in dialogue more, because that's what I enjoy. Um, if I've moved to Melbourne, I very strongly suspect I would, that would have happened. So, you know, the random decision just to stay in Brisbane because it was a nice day when we got off the plane, that had a massive impact. But then again, we've got three kids. You know, maybe the, it wouldn't have happened in Melbourne. It's, you know, you don't know. I'm not really, I don't like hypothesis not hypothesizing but kind of trying to guess what if what if yeah 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 sure um to end i do do just want to ask you about teaching at qut you've done you've done a course there for a few years tell tell me about that yeah so at qut um i about three or four years ago um i got asked to step in on sex drugs rock and roll the wonderfully named sex drugs rock and roll um unit uh, via music and sound um, standing in for Steve Dillon, who was very ill and um, really sadly died a few months later. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into because I'd never, you know, I, d- I didn't know anything about it. I just had Steve's notes on it. Hmm. Um, and I just, basically the instruction I got was just, well, you know, do what you want. Um, so I interpreted it as um, Steve had kind of given all these students kind of seven key concepts as tools that they could help to use, analyze music with, um, like authenticity, you know, how does the way that you view music, you know, if you think everything needs to be authentic or inauthentic, how does that change the way that you listen to music? Or if you're really concerned about gender imbalance, that presumably affects the way that you listen to music. Mm. Or, you know, uh, drugs and transcendence is an obvious one. Um, And so I just basically interpreted it. I, I took two main mantras 
with me, which I kind of stuck to pretty much, was the first one was that there's no good and bad way to listen to music. There's only good and bad listeners, which I think is great. I attribute it to John Peel, a British DJ. I don't know if it is or not. Um, could be. And the other one of which is, what's the other one? Oh, it's just basically, you know, um, so you know you like music, you know you love music, why? Articulate and, it. Well, sorry? You get forced them to articulate it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, well, I like it because it's a good song. No, that's not the reason you like it. Mm. Not normally. You like it because of everything except that. Mm. You like it because of your mates. You like it because of where you grew up. You like it because of your culture. You like it for political reasons. You know, a good song, no. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with One Direction songs. The reason people dislike One Direction is nothing to do with their music. They might not like the sound of their voice, but that's about it. So what are all these other reasons? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's what it comes down to. Have you enjoyed teaching? Yeah, I love teaching. Uh, it gives me that... Uh, dialogue that discourse that I crave I'm going to really miss my sex drugs like old kids for sure um, you know you learn so much stuff when you're teaching um, and I, I mean the way I teach in that unit in particular which I think is probably quite distinct to most other university units is I only ever write the lecture the night before and then I don't normally use what I've written anyway and it tends to be very improvised and very spontaneous mm. and um yeah, it's, it's just a hell of a lot of fun. And I will miss it because it gives students a chance to be creative as well. And quite a few of them over the years have said, you know, that they appreciate it, which is nice. And also hate it. <laughs> Thank you, Everett. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for listening to Penmanship and thank you to my guest Everett True. As a bit of a postscript to this interview, you'll be pleased to know that Everett's PhD was accepted with some minor changes required. He's now back in the UK. For show notes on today's episode, visit penmanshippodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Till next time.